You know, over the years, I was trying to calculate how many stories I have prepared for publication or the audio format. And uh, I think it's probably over a thousand. Uh, my daily devotionals, there are at least a hundred stories in each of those. My book on um, God is Faithful is full of stories. My book on Israel has stories in them. Uh, newspaper articles and uh, Uplook magazine articles and articles I've written for the Choice Gleanings over the years. Probably <laughs> that many. And every week I'm looking for more stories. And I, I have to confess that probably today uh, this is the equivalent of uh, button soup. You know the story. It's been told in all different ways. Uh, it's a very old story. Sometimes it's called stone soup or even axe soup. The idea is that someone who has a pot but nothing to put in it um, starts cooking up soup. And it's uh, whatever the object is, a button or stone. And uh, the people who are curious, they say, well, they, they're not willing to contribute to the soup. But when they're told that actually... Um, this soup is going to be wonderful. It, it's a little better if, you know, there are a few carrots in it, but otherwise it's just great. And, and so they contribute those carrots and little by little, the soup grows until eventually uh, something delicious comes out of it and the, the item is discarded. So in looking through my old books today, I, I came across a few little snippets here and there. It's hardly a, a banquet, but I think you'll find a few of these things interesting just the same. Uh, the first thing I wanted to show you is this old book. It's very hard for you to read the title, perhaps, on it. Um, but on the inside flyleaf are my mother's childish handwritten uh, information. This is an old school dictionary that she had. Now, next month, Lord willing, my my mother would have been a hundred years old. She was born in 1924. And if you want to see how far things have slipped, all you have to do is open up this dictionary and you'll see things like this. Now this is this was written specifically for uh, public school children in Canada um, that, that many years ago. And for example, under the listing for God, it has noun, the maker and upholder of all things, the being whom men worship. Uh, for gospel, it says, the story of God's grace, the good news about Christ. Back here, I was looking at salvation, and it says, uh, deliverance from danger or destruction freedom from the power and punishment of sin, eternal life, or sanctify, to make holy, to set apart, to free from sin or defilement. This is back in the days when they actually thought that children were not educated unless they knew the message of the world's all-time bestseller. Unfortunately, that has slipped by the boards. But I came across another old book, and, and I'm going to read a little section out of this. This is um, uh, The Life of uh, Dwight Moody by his son. Whoops, I guess I should have over here. It's a, a large book and uh, many stories in it. But I was reading the little section here where he talks about wanting to come to Britain. And uh, there were two men that he wanted to meet on this journey, and one of them was Charles Spurgeon, and the other was George Mueller. And this he did. But on that journey, um, it was the first time he heard the statement, the world has yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by the man who is fully consecrated to him. And uh, his son, Will, writes the following. He said, a man, thought Moody. He did not say a great man, or a learned man, nor a rich man, nor a wise man, nor an eloquent man, nor a smart man, 
but simply a man. I am a man. And it lies within the man himself whether he will or will not make that entire and full consecration. I will try my utmost to be that man. Also on that journey, uh, he was quite involved with the YMCA in those days, the Young Men's Christian Association, which was a center of evangelism and Bible study and discipleship of young men. And they were very unashamed uh, with the, the fact that it was a Christian association. And uh, he was invited to speak at their headquarters in London. And on that occasion, he used an illustration. And I just want to apply that illustration and use it with you today. It really struck me when I read it. He told the story that Napoleon, after uh, achieving a tremendous victory over the combined Russian and Austrian forces. This is in um, December 2nd, I think, of 1805, the Battle of Austerlitz. Austerlitz. And after the battle, Napoleon ordered a commemorative medal to be made for the participants. They were quite significantly outnumbered by the Russians and Austrians, and yet they, they won the battle and really broke this alliance and forced Austria to sue for peace, and it changed the whole um, framework of, of Europe at that time. Anyway, he had this commemorative medal made, and on the obverse was the image of the emperor, and on the reverse was the name of the battle and the simple words, I was there. And it really struck me as I thought about these words that someday, there will be those who will gather and discover that a little prayer meeting, maybe of a few old folks in a, in a basement somewhere, that that was the turning point in the work of God in that region of the world. Or maybe they were praying for some missionaries in a foreign land on the other side of the world. And the question would be, when I had an opportunity, was I there? A young couple who are bereaved over the loss of a child, or an old shut-in who, whose family has abandoned her, uh, perhaps um, someone who's struggling in the faith, a few young men willing to stand out on um, the street corner and preach the gospel. Would you be qualified to receive the medal that has the King of Kings on the one side, and on the other side, the simple words, I was there. We have opportunities every day. And the question really is, am I all there? Wherever I am to be all there. God said to Moses one day, I want to meet you in the mountain and be there. And, you know, this is a day when people are flagging. It's exhausting. It's hard work. We, we feel the opposition of the enemy. We feel the rising tide of the culture wars, the frustrations that we face in our society as people turn away from the message of the Bible. We can't flag, right? We shall reap if we faint not. And then again, men ought always to pray and not to faint. In the words of the psalmist, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the Lord in the land of the living. And so as we, as we think about the significance of every prayer, of every tear, of every individual, sometimes we overlook the little things. But Many a time, it's a hand on a shoulder, it's a kind word, it's an encouragement, it's a prayer that turns the tide of history, true spiritual history. And may it be said when we gather at home at last, that when I had the opportunity, maybe it was a cold night, maybe I was exhausted from work, maybe I didn't feel like showing up at the hospital or the funeral home. 
but I was there. By the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit and by my loyalty to the Lord Jesus and my love for his people and my care for the lost, by God's grace, I was there. <laughs>